When you are developing multiple bounded contexts, at some point you will need to share your application models or components between these bounded contexts to prevent duplication. The solution that Domain Driven Design proposes is creating a shared kernel that will encapsulate these shared components so that they can be used between multiple bounded contexts. And I'm going to show you how to create it in this video. So what would fall under the umbrella of a shared kernel? For example, it could be the entity model, which also encapsulates the concept of domain events. And you will find that I created most of these components inside of the abstractions folder. So this folder is acting as a shared kernel of sorts only inside of the domain project itself. However, this solution isn't practical if I want to split my bounded contexts into multiple projects, which is why I'm going to create a shared kernel project and move these classes inside. So let's go ahead and add another class library inside of our source folder. This is going to be a .NET 7 class library and I'll call it shared kernel. Let's go ahead and delete the empty class from this project. And I'm going to move all of the types that are inside of the abstractions folder in my domain into the shared kernel project. In order for our domain project to continue working, it will need a reference to the shared kernel project. So I'm going to define it. And I'm also going to refactor the files that are inside of my shared kernel to update their namespace. So I'm going to use a refactoring from Resharper to speed this up. And now if I go back to my user entity, you'll see that it's referencing the shared kernel namespace. So using this approach, we are able to share our components like the entity, error, idomain event, and the result object between multiple bounded contexts in our domain. And this makes it easier for us to maintain these shared components and prevent code duplication. The shared kernel doesn't necessarily only have to contain generic types like this. It could also contain entities and value objects that we need to share between multiple bounded contexts. You can see an example of that on this diagram and you'll notice that there is an overlap between our bounded contexts and this would represent our shared kernel. Now, in my example, these are only some generic components that are reusable in our bounded context. But as I mentioned, this could also be some shared entities or value objects that are important for both of the bounded contexts. And you don't necessarily want to maintain two separate implementations, one for each bounded context. So let's expand the shared kernel implementation. Right now, I only have the simple result implementation, but I don't have a generic result. So I'm going to create a generic result inside, which is going to be a public class with a generic argument. So this will be my result of T. This class will implement from the base result class. And I'm actually going to rename the generic argument to T value. And this is because I want to encapsulate a read only value inside. I'm allowing this value to be nullable because I'm going to control it from my constructor, which will be protected and internal. And it's going to accept the nullable value as the argument. It's also going to accept a flag which will represent if this is a success or a failure result and a potential error in case of a failure result. So now I want to assign this value to the one I get in the constructor. And for the remaining two arguments, I want to pass them to my base constructor. However, the base constructor is private. So I'm going to have to update it to be protected and internal. And now I'll be able to reference it from the result of T type. The next thing I want to do is to expose a property that's going to return back a value. This will be a get only property which is going to check if this is a success result. And if this is true, it's going to return the value. And I'm going to make sure through the factory methods that this value can't be null. So I'm going to use a null forgiving operator here. And otherwise, if this is a failure result, I'm going to throw an invalid operation exception. I'll give it a message of the value of a failure result can't be accessed. And this should be enough to explain why you can't access this value. One more thing that could be useful is an implicit operator that's going to convert a generic value into a result of t value response. So this will be a nullable value. And what I'm going to do is check if the value is not null, for example, because this is a positive condition, I'm going to create a success result and pass it the value. Otherwise, I'm going to create a failure result and pass it an error of null value. So this 
particular error doesn't exist, neither do the factory methods accepting these values, so I'm going to go ahead and create them one by one. So first of all, I want the null value error inside of my error class, so this will be the null value, and let's give it a code and a description. So error null value, and the description will be null value was provided. So now if I go back to my result of t, this should compile, and what's missing is my factory methods. So this will be static methods inside of the result class to simplify calling of this method, but they are going to return a result of t value back. So this will be the success method accepting a t value argument, and it's going to have a not null t value. And this is important because then I can just call my constructor pass in the value, pass in true, and pass in error none for the error value. And I'm also going to create one more factory method, again returning a t value instance, and this one is going to be failure of t value, it's going to accept an error instance, it's going to call the constructor, pass default for the value, false for a success, and the error argument as the third parameter. Also, I'm going to specify t value here, to make the argument explicit and this is my implementation of a generic result type and now how i would use this is for example in the email value object if i want to enforce my factory method without throwing exceptions so what i would do is update the return type to be a result of email and then i need to implement my validations using the result Pattern. So I'll say if string is null or empty and pass in the email, then I need to return a failure result instead of invoking this card clause. So let's create a static class that's going to hold my email errors. So let's call it email errors. And I want to define two errors inside. So public static read only error. Let's give it the name of empty. And I'm going to create a new error instance, which will have an email empty as the code and the description will be email is empty. One more error that I have will be for the invalid format. So let's give it that name, invalid format, and let's create a new error instance. So the error code will be email invalid format and the description is going to be email format is invalid. So now I'm going to use these in my create method to return a result failure of email and specify email errors empty. And then inside of the second if statement, instead of throwing an exception, I'm going to return the invalid format error. So now I'm not throwing exceptions. I'm using the result pattern and I need to run my build to see if anything is broken because now this no longer returns the email value object. I first need to go through my results value. Let me also fix the other tests that I have, I'm going to run the build again. This will now fail in my domain service tests and this should be everything. So the build passes and I can rerun my tests to make sure that nothing is broken. So I managed to do my refactoring and introduce a generic result object in my shared kernel. Another example of something that you would see inside of a shared kernel is the concept of a date time provider or service or system clock. You'll often have a requirement to provide the current time in your domain. Right now, I'm accepting the UTC now as an argument in my follower service. However, I can create an abstraction that's going to provide this inside of the shared kernel. So let's, for example, say I have a new interface inside of my shared kernel that I will call I date time provider. This interface will have just one date time property, which will be called UTC now. And it's only going to have a get accessor to obtain the current UTC time value. How I'm going to use this is just injected through the follower service constructor. So I'll create a private read only field, inject the I date time provider and inject this from the constructor. I'm going to align this so that you can see it nicely. And really the only place that I'm using the date time value is here. And now I can replace this with date time provider UTC now, which also means I can get rid of this argument because I'm now using my injected date time provider to obtain the current time required here. I'm also going to have to fix my follower service tests, which are now 
broken. So what I'm going to do is just provide a substitute, which is going to return a mocked version of my I date time provider because my tests do not depend on this value. However, I could configure it to return a specific date time instance if I wanted to run tests based on the current date and time. So I'm going to fix my test cases and let's see if everything compiles. And the one problem I run into is I need the UTC now value to verify my follower repository mock. So how I'm going to solve this is return back the private static read only field, which will be a date time instance. Let's call it UTC now and let's give it the date time UTC now value. Now, if I just try to run this like so, my test will probably fail because the mocked instance isn't returning the current date and time. So if I take a look at which test failed, it is this one here because we can't match on this condition. So all I would need to do is to configure my mocked date time provider. So so let's introduce a variable temporarily and I'm going to configure the date time provider UTC now to return the field that I have in my class. So now that these two values are the same, I can try rerunning my tests and I expect them all to pass. And you can see that this is the case and we have managed to refactor the follower service to now use the date time provider, which is part of the shared kernel. There are multiple ways how you can distribute the shared kernel between your bounded contexts. And this will depend on how you are building your application. If this is a monolith system and everything is side of a single repository, you can have a shared project like I showed you in this example. Otherwise, if you're working in a microservices system and your services are developed in separate repositories, you can distribute the shared kernel as a NuGet package that all of your services will reference. If you enjoyed this video about the shared kernel pattern, take a look at this video next, where I'm explaining how to build a microservices system with RabbitMQ and try to figure out how a shared kernel would fit into this system when it comes to sharing components between these microservices. Make sure to subscribe to my channel for more amazing videos and until next time, stay awesome.